This is the fourth video in this series on how to interpret a chest x-ray, and the topic is the airways, bones, and soft tissues. The learning objectives are to be able to assess those structures on x-ray and to know the common etiologies of abnormalities seen in them. Let's start with the airways. On the chest x-ray, the airways can either be narrowed, deviated, or on occasion contain foreign objects. There isn't much to say about airway narrowing other than the fact that subglottic airway narrowing is an important radiographic finding in croup and tracheal stenosis. Here's an example of a three-year-old boy with several days of cough and fever. If we zoom in on the upper airway, you can see how the airway gets nearly pinched off near the very top of the film. This is sometimes referred to as the steeple sign because the airway ends up looking a bit like the steeple of a church. However, in my experience with adults, uh, narrowing of the trachea is easy to overcall when they're asymptomatic due to overlying shadows from mediastinal structures. When it comes to airway deviation, deviation of the trachea is usually caused by unequal intrathoracic pressure between the left and the right sides. Let's look at an example. We'll start off with a normal chest x-ray and superimpose an outline of the airways, the heart, the lungs, and around the lungs, the pleura. What happens when air is introduced into the pleural space, a condition known as a pneumothorax? Since the intrapleural pressure is usually lower than atmospheric pressure, more and more air will begin to accumulate, and as it does so, the lung on that side becomes compressed. If air continues to accumulate, for example in a tension pneumothorax, eventually the intrapleural space becomes distended enough that not only does it further collapse the ipsilateral lung, it begins to push the heart, mediastinal structures, and the airway to the contralateral side, resulting in tracheal deviation away from the side of the pneumothorax. For another example, Imagine a primary fibrotic process happening only in the left lung. Fibrosis leads to gradual contraction of the lung and reduced lung volumes. As this process worsens, it will begin to contract the pleura as well, shifting all of the other structures towards the affected side. And we end up with something like this. Of course, unilateral fibrotic lungs are quite rare. In this particular example, the patient actually had bilateral pulmonary fibrosis, but was status post right lung transplant. Abnormalities deviating the trachea away from the affected side include pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and an extremely large mass. Those deviating the trachea towards the affected side include marked atelectasis or collapsed lung, lobectomy or pneumonectomy, pleural fibrosis, or pulmonary fibrosis. Usually, the underlying condition leading to airway deviation is quite obvious, and knowledge of which conditions push the trachea away versus pull the trachea towards the abnormality is not critical. However, here's an example of when it is critical. Consider two x-rays in which the left hemithorax has been totally whited out. What's going on in each? If we start with the x-ray on the left and draw a midline down the vertebral bodies for comparison, we can see that the trachea is deviated away from the whited outside. Therefore, the abnormality must be causing excessive intrathoracic pressure on that side and is thus a massive left pleural effusion. The x-ray on the right is a little trickier. It would be easy to mistake this for a pleural effusion as well. However, let's draw our midline, which ends up being crooked because the patient is crooked. You can see that the trachea is deviated towards the whiteout. Therefore, there must be low pressure in the left hemithorax, which can be due to collapse of the left lung, not from a pneumothorax, but rather from something like left main bronchus obstruction from a tumor. Airways can also be deviated due to local displacement. There can be lateral deviation from mediastinal or hilar lymphadenopathy in lymphoma or a mass from other malignancies. And there can be splaying of the right and left bronchi by extreme left atrial enlargement. Here's an example of rightward deviation of the trachea due to a large mediastinal mass, which turned out to be an enormous goiter. And here's an example of splaying of the right and left main bronchi from left atrial enlargement. 
drawing in both the airways and the angle between them, known as the carinal angle, you can see that it is well above the cutoff of normal of 90 degrees. The final class of possible abnormality of the airways is a foreign body. Here's an x-ray of a toddler who presented with wheezing and shortness of breath. There appears to be something lodged in the right main bronchus. I don't know for sure what it is, but it looks awfully suspicious for one of these things, shelving supports for a certain ready-to-assemble furniture brand. And lest you think that only children aspirated foreign objects, take a look at this example. There is something small and dense in the right main bronchus again. It may be harder to immediately appreciate what it is, but if we zoom in, we can see that it's actually a tooth with a metal crown. Let's move on to bones. On chest x-ray, bones can either be fractured, deformed, sclerosed, lytic, osteopenic, or notched, which applies just to ribs. In particular, identifying osteopenia on a chest x-ray is very difficult. I don't recommend doing that unless you are an experienced radiologist, and I won't talk about it more here. First, rib fractures. Sometimes they will be very obvious. In this case, the patient has numerous fractures of his posterior left ribs, almost certainly from high impact blunt force trauma. Other times, however, a rib fracture may not be obvious. This example will be much, much harder to see, and it is probably invisible unless we zoom way in here. Unless we were given a history of left-sided chest pain after a fall, a fracture this subtle would probably be missed by the interpretation. Both of those fractures were relatively acute. However, sometimes old fractures can be identified as well. This is suggested by focal thickening of the rib consistent with callus formation. This patient has a probable old rib fracture of a right posterior rib. Be careful though because these can be mistaken for sclerotic bone lesions and vice versa. A number of other fractures can be seen on chest x-ray. Although it's not the optimal view for identifying or categorizing it, clavicular fractures can be seen. And on the lateral film, we can identify vertebral compression fractures. Next up, the difference between scoliosis and kyphosis. In scoliosis, the spine curves from side to side. This is visible on PA and AP views. In kyphosis, there is an exaggerated front to back curvature of the upper spine. It is usually only visible on lateral views. A specific form of kyphosis is seen in the barrel chest deformity, which can occur in advanced COPD. This consists of the combination of kyphosis and an increased anterior to posterior diameter of the thorax. When the AP diameter of the thorax approaches that of the side to side diameter, the thorax begins to resemble a wooden barrel from the outside. Although it's not explicitly part of the barrel chest phenomenon, you can also appreciate the flattening of the diaphragms this patient has from his COPD. As briefly mentioned a minute ago, bones can be sclerosed. Sclerosis essentially means increased density of the bones. It can be focal or diffuse. The etiologies are numerous and varying greatly depending upon the age of the patient. Overall, things to consider include an osteoblastic metastasis, primary bone tumor, various benign tumor-like bone lesions, Paget's disease of bone, and chronic osteomyelitis. As a hospitalist, I feel pretty comfortable interpreting chest x-rays, but sclerotic bone lesions are one time when I always consult a radiologist because differentiating the various possible etiologies based on radiographic appearance is a very subtle art and requires the experience only a radiologist is likely to have. Here's an example of a patient with some sclerotic rib lesions. Look closely for them. Don't worry if you can't see them. They're very subtle. In this case, two of the patient's anterior lateral ribs appear focally thicker and denser than they should even when accounting for the superimposed shadows from some of the posterior ones behind them. What's the likely diagnosis here? Well, 
Even if you are like me and find it impossible to differentiate these sclerotic lesions from one another, we can pick up clues from the other parts of the radiograph. First, what's the structure here? I'll talk more about these in Lesson 9, but it's an implanted intravenous port usually used for chemotherapy. And if you look very closely, you'll notice some haze in the mid to lower left lung. The fact that the haze is circular, well circumscribed, and relatively homogeneous makes this probably a breast implant. The combination of a unilateral breast implant with a chemotherapy port means this patient probably has advanced breast cancer, and those two sclerotic bone lesions would be concerning for metastatic disease. This case is a little unusual in that bone mets in breast cancer are usually osteolytic and not osteoblastic, as seen here. Which brings us to the lytic lesions. These are areas of bone where the density is lower than normal. They can either be solitary or multiple. The etiologies are remarkably analogous to those of sclerotic lesions. Osteolytic mets, multiple myeloma, various benign cyst-like bone lesions, Paget's disease, and acute osteomyelitis. And once again, the differential diagnosis varies greatly depending upon the age of the patient. Here's an example of a lytic rib lesion, which in this case was actually due to tuberculosis. Rib notching is the focal deformation of one or more ribs that occurs on the rib surface. The etiologies depend upon whether the superior or inferior surface is affected. Notching on the superior surface, which is less common, can be seen in osteogenesis imperfecta, connective tissue diseases, local pressure, or hyperparathyroidism. Notching on the inferior surface, which is more common, can be seen in coarctation of the aorta, subclavian or SVC obstruction, and in patients who are status post a blalock talsig shunt, which is a surgical procedure for complex congenital heart disease in which only the two upper ribs will be notched. Here is a patient with some rib notching. It may be hard to see unless we get a little closer. And to make it more visible, I'll outline the posterior ribs. Notice how the superior surfaces of the ribs are nice and smooth while some of the inferior surfaces are ever so slightly jagged. Before leaving the bones, there is one anatomic variant I like to mention because it's relatively common and can be very confusing to understand if its existence is not already known to you. It's something called a cervical rib, in which an extra rib arises from the seventh cervical vertebrae. The overall prevalence is usually cited in the neighborhood of 0.5 to 1%, with a greater prevalence in women than men. Cervical ribs can be either unilateral or bilateral. They are usually identified as an incidental finding, but can cause thoracic outlet syndrome by compression of vascular structures and or the brachial plexus. Relative to the bones, there is comparatively less to look for in the soft tissues. One quite dramatic abnormality is subcutaneous emphysema, which is air within the subcutaneous tissues. This can occur due to air being introduced from within, as in a dissecting pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, or pulmonary interstitial emphysema, all of which can complicate positive pressure ventilation. Sub-Q emphysema can also be from air introduced ex externally from penetrating chest wall trauma as a consequence of thoracic surgery, or from complications from a chest tube. Finally, the sub-Q gas can be produced locally by a necrotizing infection with a gas-producing organism, otherwise known as gas gangrene. Depending upon where you practice medicine, another soft tissue abnormality that may be seen from time to time is shrapnel injury. Here's an x-ray of an acutely wounded soldier. We can see that there are a number of small metallic objects that have penetrated his body on the left side. This one here is clearly extrathoracic. However, what about the largest one? Where exactly is this fragment? It obviously looks to be within the left lung, but remember that x-rays are just two-dimensional projections of the three-dimensional body. If we get a lateral film for comparison, we can see that the largest fragment is probably posterior to the lungs and is instead sitting between two ribs. If you look again to the PA film, 
you can see a prominent rib fracture here where the fragment probably struck and ricocheted. The very last thing I'd like to cover in this video is not part of airways, bones, and soft tissues, but this seemed like the most obvious place to mention it. That is, when interpreting x-rays, be sure to identify objects that are external to the patient. Sometimes, these will be obvious, but not always. Consider this x-ray. What do you see? There's obviously a very dense, small thing seen right in the middle of the right lung. But if you look closer, you'll also notice a superimposed, large, vertically oriented linear opacity. For those not sure what I'm talking about, let me outline it. What is this? Luckily, the radiology technologist noticed it and realized that it corresponded to the patient's hair braid. The braid was then moved out of the way, the x-ray retaken, and the linear shadow has disappeared. The bottom line, whenever there is a shadow on the x-ray that doesn't make sense, especially if it doesn't respect normal anatomic boundaries, consider whether the shadow could represent an extracorporeal object. That concludes this video on assessing the airways, bones, and soft tissue. The next video will cover assessment of the heart and mediastinum.